extremely hot topic, and I think nobody uh, better qualified, there's nobody better qualified to talk about this than uh, Ambassador Michael from Switzerland, who has a legal background and, in fact, before entering the world of diplomacy, worked in uh, various legal positions in the, in the canton of Zurich uh, and also in the education department at, at uh, Zurich, and also a little bit outside her diplomatic career, took some time off um, from the foreign ministry and went on several ICRC uh, international career, the Red Cross missions to Rwanda. Um, she served in postings in Tel Aviv and Washington and in very senior positions, senior legal positions in Bern. Um, so without further ado, uh, I'd like to welcome the Ambassador and uh, we look forward to hearing your very interesting and important. Thank you. between a direct democratic process and, and <coughs> others. 
So first of all, democratic procedures, when it, decisions about substantive issues, it's about issues, it's not about electing people, we, we can decide on issues. And the second criteria, it serves to empower citizens. So it is not something that is initiated and controlled from above, from government, from parliament, it's something that comes from below, from the, from, from the people. Um, so plebiscites, they have nothing to do with the direct democracy. Uh, to give you maybe, um, a New Zealand um, example, and I hope I'm not wrong, so you can correct me, but the last general election that you had, I think, um, there was also a referendum on, on, on the question of the electoral system, on MMP and, and, and other systems, and that was initiated by government. It was government who decided that they would like to submit that to the people. That is not a direct democratic element. A direct democratic element, it, it must come from below. From, we'll, I'll get to more detail to that. In a genuine direct democracy, um, it, is, it is the law or the constitution that um, stipulates when it is mandatory for the citizens to be consulted. So it's not up to the discretion of government or parliament or the ones in power to decide, but it's, it's the law that decides when people have to be consulted. And, secondly, when the citizens can decide for themselves that they have to be consulted. So it's their initiative. So this is a big difference between the plebiscite that comes from government or parliament. <coughs> In Switzerland, um, direct democracy means that a referendum takes place because the group of voters demands it or because it is stipulated in the constitution. Government cannot call a referendum. There is no such thing as a plebiscite in Switzerland. Now, if we look at the political rights at the federal level, I just mentioned before Switzerland is a federal state, we have 26 cantons, so what happens in the cantons can differ quite a bit from federal states. In the cantons, you will very often find more direct democratic rights. So, I'm only going to talk on, on a federal level today. Obviously, we have elections every four years, we elect parliament just like you do in New Zealand every three years. And also there is voting. Voting on citizens' initiatives and referendums. There are three um, main direct democratic procedures. <coughs> One is the mandatory referendum, and the referendum must be held. Two, an optional referendum. And three, the citizens' initiative. The mandatory referendum that applies to all amendments to the Constitution. So whenever the Constitution is being amended, a referendum must be held. There's no choice of that. And also, if there is an accession to organizations for collective security, like the United Nations, or a supranational um, community, um, uh, except the United Nations, European Union, NATO, etc. In all these cases, a popular vote must be held, that the citizens have to be um, consulted. And that might lead to this kind of map. Switzerland is not in the European Union. It's in the heart of Europe, but not in the European Union. And that has to do that Swiss citizens have to be consulted. It's not the government, not parliament that can decide whether Switzerland wants to become a member or will become a member of the European Union or not. And we know that there is no majority um, amongst the Swiss citizens for joining the European Union, and that's the result. Um, I would say if in other countries we would have a mandatory referendum, this map would also slightly look different, maybe a little less blue. So, mandatory referendum whenever there is an amendment to the Constitution or when it deals with accession to organizations for collective security for supranational communities. The optional referendum allows citizens to challenge laws passed by parliament. 
So if citizens don't like what their elected parliament is doing, they can challenge it. Now again, if I take an, an, an example out of the New Zealand context, we know um, the privatization of state-owned asset sales a um, majority of New Zealanders is against. If that were in Switzerland, a parliament would not do it because they know citizens um, they would they would do it a referendum and they would not have the majority. So citizens can challenge laws passed by parliament, but not only that, it's also international treaties. Another example in the Swiss context, there are a number of bilateral agreements with the European Union and a certain number of Swiss citizens said, well, uh, we don't like what the government did. We don't like these bilateral agreements. And um, a referendum was held and the majority of the Swiss citizens said, no, that's a good thing. Yes, go ahead. And so we do have these bilateral agreements as they were concluded um, by the government. Same accession to international organizations, Swiss citizens can challenge that. The question was whether Switzerland should become a member of the Bretton Woods Institution, so IMF, World Bank, etc. Um, government thought that's a good idea, we'll go for it, but there were a number of Swiss citizens that said, well, I'd like to challenge that, we, we don't like that. However, again, a majority of the Swiss citizens said, no, that's a good idea, that the part of the Bretton Woods Institutions. It needs 50,000 citizens requesting that a popular bell be held in 100 days. So, if we look um, um, at the optional referendum, this very much acts um, like a break. It's, it's like a veto. Not like that. Then we take the referendum, the optional referendum. And the effect is that it forces government and parliament to draft a proposal that can pass the referendum. So it's a constant search for political compromise, for consensus. Otherwise, there will always be the threat of a referendum, as we call it. It puts quite a lot of pressure of the parliamentarians. The parliamentarians they do need to take into account as, as wide a spectrum as possible of political opinions. So they will not be the referendum or a referendum will be successful. The third um, main political tool is the citizens initiative. Um, it gives citizens the right to make laws. It needs 100,000 signatures in 18 months, so more than for an optional referendum, yet there is longer time to collect the signatures. The Citizens' Initiative acts as a driving force. It acts as innovating. The referendum is a veto, it's a break, it's no, we don't like that. Here, the citizens, they can actually do something about it, propose things. Um, I'll give you an example. Switzerland, just a few months ago, um, this is Citizens' Initiative, and citizens um, said, well, Four weeks of paid holidays and half in Switzerland, that's not good enough. We should have, we worked so hard, we should have six weeks of paid holidays. Now, if you were Swiss, what would you do? If you want six weeks of paid holidays instead of four, who wants that? Yeah, yeah? Well, but it's a minority that would want that. Same as the Swiss. The Swiss said, nah, nah, four weeks is good enough, we stick to that. Um, if we look at um, citizens' initiatives, um, how many have been adopted um, and how many have been rejected, it's very hard for citizens' in initiatives to be successful. As the example that I have just showed you with, with the holidays, um, there's a success rate of only 9 out of 10 that make it. So since 1891, the Swiss have voted on 174 citizens' initiatives. You see that by the columns. And only 18 out of these 174 were approved. These are the ones that, the ones that are marked in red, uh, that are above the 50% uh, line. So you see a really very, very large majority is rejected. Um, for optional referendums, it looks a bit different. You can tell more have been successful. It's almost one in three has been successful. So we can definitely say it's much easier to, to, to veto a law than to amend the constitution, to 
slide from 1891. I put in bold the ones that are um, have shaped the Swiss political system. And as you can see, the majority, three quarters of all the approved um, citizens' initiative have not had a fundamental impact. So it's, it's, it's only it's a few of them who have had a fundamental impact. <coughs> Yet, effects of citizens' initiatives, um, they can result in changes in law and society even when they are rejected. <coughs> I give you um, an example. It was um, a couple of months ago, um, there was the youth wing of the Green Party, and um, they collected 100,000 signatures and they said, well, we'd like to ban four-wheel drive cars. They use too much gas, um, lots of greenhouse gas emissions, um, very dangerous to pedestrians and to cyclists, would like to ban them. Parliament thought, well, this is a good idea in that, but we don't quite like that. So they came up with a counter-proposal, and what they said, we amend an existing law, and we would set a lower limit for greenhouse gas emissions for new cars and impose a special tax for those with higher output. And the youth wing of the Green Party said, well, it's not 100% what we wanted, but actually what well, the counter proposal, what they're proposing, that's very much our idea, what we would like to have. We withdrew the initiative and everybody was happy. So we see, even if a citizen initiative is not successful, it can very much have an impact. It can place an issue on the political agenda, which has been ignored either by authorities or political parties because they think it's a hot potato, or because they just think it's not worthwhile or for whatever reason. The citizens' initiative can put it on the plate, and you have to talk about it. Citizens' initiative can also channel protest of dissatisfaction because people can speak out, they can come up with a constructive proposal, not only saying I'm against, no, they can do something actually. And they can bring opposition forces into the political system. 